Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate your time today. We've got a great topic for you today and uh, looking forward to sharing it with you. Um, I'm a product manager here at CATI for the simulation product line that we offer. So all things simulation is, is my favorite. So uh, just a quick quick uh, poll and put in the chat, if we have any, any regular simulation users here, let me know if you're a regular user. I just kind of like to get that information. And it's okay if you're not, hopefully everyone will learn something from this uh, presentation. This presentation was given, I gave this at the uh, Kansas City's um, SOLIDWORKS user group meeting, it was a virtual meeting they had in July of this year. So if you attended that, know that this is a sort of a repeat, repeat performance of that with a few tweaks here and there. But um, so looking forward to sharing this information for you and here's where we're going. Any response there in the chat, uh, Chris, on how many users are out there? How many regular users? I see a couple coming in. Okay, <clears throat> good deal. All right, so here's our roadmap. We're gonna just basically give you an idea of how you can use simulation to analyze welded structures. Very common uh, technique for designing parts in SOLIDWORKS and uh, hopefully this will give you some good insight into that. So who is this sim guy talking to you? My name is Kurt Curtin. I've been with uh, Computer Aided Technology for um, several years now. I was I started in the VAR world back in 2005, been using simulations since about the 2000 release. So cut my teeth uh, working out of college uh, at uh, a contractor for NASA, working on the shuttle and, and space station programs. It's where I cut my teeth real, literally with uh, finite element tools a little bit of background in college, but uh, really got into the meat of it there, helping a senior engineer on those projects. After grad school, I went into uh, the oil field industry designing oil, uh, surface wellhead com components for the oil industry. And um, it's a couple of different uh, uh, philosophies, if you, if you think about the two industries, uh, you know, those space, that space hardware has got to fly, and it's got to be safe, so very important to keep it uh, light and strong. On the other hand, uh, oil field, uh, the motto is kind of like, if it breaks, just add more steel to it. Get out your welder. <laughs> but um, in, as part of that oil field equipment, you know, we designed some very high pressure, high temperature sealing components, metal sealing components like you see here. And so really, you know, the, the finite element analysis really came into play with both of these industries and, and still is a very important part with, um, with, with uh, designing products. So, Basically, uh, you know, it's a super important topic and uh, one of my favorites. So let's jump into uh, the analysis. We're going to be looking at this uh, frame, this weldment, this frame weldment, and uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of background information. It's basically the, the boat trailer for this uh, 1989 Blastron boat. It's, uh, it's a very simple structure. It's uh, mostly channel members that are welded together, as you see in this the pattern here. Um, all, of, all of the main members are channel members. We've got some, some two by six lumber that uh, supports the boat itself through some metal brackets that uh, tie that into the, to the rest of the frame. There's a side view of that. You can kind of see some of the supporting members over here uh, tying things together. And then finally, some detail, basically the hitch. It's got a uh, formed sheet metal type part up, up top here that's attached to the vehicle, some more structural members, and then some close-up of the attachment here, bringing the, the channels and the uh, supporting runners together through a, a simple bracket. And as you see here, it looks like I've got some issues to look at, uh, a little rust coming through at that, that other side of that weld. So it's a, uh, Good thing to try to take a look at the uh, stresses going into these parts and make sure we're not going to have a failure. Uh, the other are items of interest are these pads where the springs, the leaf springs come into play and interact with uh, the channel, the channel frame itself. So um, keep those, those uh, little details in mind as we get into the actual modeling of it. So I don't know how many of you, how many of you have worked with weldments in SOLIDWORKS. Like I said, it's a very powerful tool. And so I want to give you a little bit of a background about how the, the weldments work in SOLIDWORKS. Basically, you start with the sketch. Um, you can have a 
2D or 3D sketch. You can make it as elaborate as you need, and you locate your structural components with the, the lines in those sketches. So you see here a simple rectangular two-dimensional sketch, and uh, basically you go into the weldment structural member, pick the profile that you want to use, either from standards that come with a, a very extensive library, or uh, you can create your own. So here you see I'm going to grab a uh, three-inch channel and just put those using the, the lines that designate the perimeter of this. So it's as simple as that. Uh, with clicking on those sketch lines, you add those structural members. There's more to it. You can you can locate those either at the centroid of the of the cross sectional uh, of the cross section of the of the beam, or you can do it as in this case at the corners. So it's very very quick and easy to get um, your design developed within SolidWorks Weldments. Now, once you turn on simulation and you start working on the simulation side of things, it's very straightforward because we're working directly in the CAD environment. See, here you see the simulation being added in and then the uh, simulation tab selected, a study created, and then we go straight away after creating that study to um, the parts folder. And you'll see there's four parts in there and they look like little beams and that's because they are they will be meshed as uh, beam elements in the simulation side and one important thing to note is that although the the weldment that was created here is very nice and clean it's got the automatically mitered corners the uh, simulation doesn't really care if those are clean or not so i'll show you that in the trailer model that uh, i left one of uh, two of those uh, joints open and, and not trimmed and uh, Simulations can handle that and does it quite well. So that's a very quick overview of Wellmets. And um, so let's go ahead and uh, look into it, the, uh, the static analysis of that. So before we um, jump into it, we have to understand the, the nature of simulation. We, we will most likely end up with a mixed mesh. And so I showed you how the beams will be created when we have a well, a structural weldment. Well, there's very few, all but the most simple um, weldment is gonna is going to have some other items involved that would be made from either a solid geometry or some some surface geometry. And so in the in that case where you have the mixture of solids and uh, shells and uh, weldment. You can have a mixture of meshes in within simulation, so you'll have beams, solids, and shells. So that's just the nature of uh, most uh, weldment analysis. You can have a mixture. As a result of that mixture, there's some incompatibility between those elements. So you see some the mesh of some structural members, a generic representation of the structural members, together with a shell mesh of the trailer hitch itself. And so we have to do some manual bonding to tie things together when that's the case. And I'll show you some of that as well. <clears throat> so when we jump into the program, my intent is to show you a, a staged finite element model development. Just the very nature of this mixture of, of elements. And for really any complicated um, assembly that you're an analyzing within simulation, I really strongly encourage you to use this, this staged development process. There's two different methods, two schools of thought on this. My favorite is to use the, uh, the technique of excluding bodies from the analysis and then starting simple and including those in copies of the, of the analyses of the studies. You can do a similar thing using configurations where you suppress or resolve components. And so basically, you know, the, the, the intent here or the point is to add components in complexity with each successive study. So I'll show you how we have multiple studies involved in this part, in this analysis of this part, and uh, we increase the complexity and we work through things related to the setup as we go along. So I really can't stress that enough. Uh, it's really true for any complex assembly that you're working with within SOLIDWORKS simulation. So let's go ahead and jump into it <coughs> and get into SOLIDWORKS here. And here is our trailer frame. And you should be seeing my SOLIDWORKS interface now. 
let us know if that's not the case. So this is a, a part model. It's a it's a weldment. You'll see we have the weldment feature here from SolidWorks that gets created as soon as we add any structural members like you see here. And the result of this, adding these structural members is that we get cut list. So that's useful for you know, your uh, production of your, your weldment part out in the, uh, on the on the shop floor. And so if you look at this cut list, you can see the, the manner in which I created these, uh, this weldment. So here is a four by a channel four by uh, 5.4 pounds per foot. And so that's uh, one of two members that were created with this within this cut list. And you'll notice that um, as I zoom in here, you'll see that this, this joint has been trimmed up like I indicated, whereas this one has not. So I just left this one intentionally untrimmed for the purpose of the, uh, the demonstration that simulation can handle it. See that that, that that beam literally goes through the other beam. All right, so um, looking further into this here, you see lots of other features. We've got um, down below the, the cut list. I've got a material to find. I've got uh, some reference sketches and planes in here. And if you notice that uh, this plane, this sketch here was, was the one that I used to generate the that structural member that goes across there, that particular that particular brace across there. Looking down a little further, we've got uh, an imported body. That would be the hitch that I mentioned up here. So that was an imported body that I moved around with some move copy bodies. And then some other features in here to generate this lower plate that you see, uh, supporting plate that ties things together. And finally, the uh, pads where the suspension, the leaf springs will interact with the frame are shown here. And so those are uh, all just solid extrusions, just like that other plate. So as I mentioned, we'll have a mixture of solids and uh, beams in this analysis. <clears throat> all right, so uh, looking into the the, uh, the simulation side of things. When I create a new study, and there again, as Chris mentioned, if you have questions along the way, put those in the, the chat there. We'll be happy to address those at the end. I'm gonna go ahead and just create a static study. <laughs> and you'll notice um, some things that you may not, not may have never seen before if you don't do any uh, analysis of wellness yet. The biggest thing is these little dots, these little spheres. And those are basically the joint group that gets set up that defines where the beams are tied together. So everywhere I have one of those spheres is where I have the end of a beam. Now they're this purple or pink color if there is more than one beam coming together at that point. They're the olive color if it's just nothing else attached to it. So that's our, our joint group. And if I go into the uh, edit definition of that, you can kind of see how it works and you can see where you can make some changes to joints. Say I had another brace that, that theoretically would come across here for some reason. I had another brace in here and maybe it came in, it came into the to the to the to play here, maybe a little bit above this point. I could have the program merge that all into one joint if I wanted to. So right now on this joint I've got the three channel members. There's one, two, and three. So any anytime I wanted to add any another member, if there was a member, I could just click on it, it would become part of that joint group. So it's quick and easy to see where things are tied together and if they're if they're tied together correctly. And the tips and tricks that I'm going to show you after I get through working in SolidWorks, you'll see that uh, the way that these uh, beam or these structural members were generated really has an influence on where these joints, these points, uh, the joint connections end up. And if it's and if it's accurately accurately captured the geometry, so keep that in mind for the tips and tricks. <laughs> Another thing I want to show you in here is looking at this from a, a top view and zooming into this corner, our favorite little corner here. I can also turn on and show the neutral axis for my beams. So you can see those lines here that, that represent the neutral axes. It's important to understand how our beams are are set up. We can also show the shear center, another important quantity for 
structural analysis. So that information is available to us right here in the joint group. All right. Um, so once we um, look into our our parts parts uh, folder here within the simulation, you will see a similar structure of those those uh, cutlass items. So that's uh, that comes over cleanly, and it has our materials defined for us. Carries over from the the uh, part level. All right, let's see um, what else did I want to show you here. We've got um, so so my my staged approach. You'll see I've got my my studies down here that I that I'm going to show you the results for static one, two, three, and so on. So to to get things started in here, I don't want to try to to um, tackle this whole thing. I've got these interactions that I'm not sure if my automatic bonding is going to come into play. If you're familiar with simulation, you know that there's a, a default setting here to bond everything together. I don't know how well that's going to work with this mixed mesh. So what I typically want to do is I want to go in here and exclude some things and get the uh, get an idea of where I need to go to make some changes. For instance, in this area here, I've got these uh, these little brackets that I know need to be tied into the beam as well, the lower channel beam as well as the upper uh, two by six. So to kind of start figuring that out, if I just were to mesh and run this, I would probably get get a failure in some of those areas, and it would be hard to tell where those are coming into play and what I need to change. So if, what I want to do first is I'll find out where all these beams are for the timber or the two by sixes. It's going to be these uh, four items here. And what I can do in simulation is just control select all of them and right click, and then I can exclude those from the analysis. This is that method number one I referred to, whereby you uh, use the exclude from analysis technique. So once I've done that, you'll notice that they, they disappear from view, and I get sort of a, a ghost image of them that shows that's where they were. As soon as I start working with the model, um, you know, they, they follow along and show me where those were. When I click outside of it, they're gone for good. So what's happening there is in, our, in the simulation options, if you weren't aware, some simulation has its own options window, just like SOLIDWORKS. So in here, you'll notice I've got the uh, checkbox here that's, that's checked that says to hide excluded bodies and show their material appearance. So that's an important thing to have on, and it makes it real easy to, to go through your model and uh, and keep the display showing you only what's involved in this model. So if you look at these, are also grayed out in the tree here. You'll see this one above it is not. So this one's active, and this one is, is grayed out. So that's pretty handy, that setting in the uh, options for simulation. <clears throat> now what I can do is, uh, on this very first study, I can go ahead and exclude these as well. Let's, let's go ahead and do that. Let's just go ahead and see if our if our structural, our channels are all going to behave well with the uh, setup that I have. So there's all of those little brackets. I'm just going to say, let's just exclude those for now as well. <coughs> and those go away. So now we're, now we're left with everything. Oh, it looks like I've got a couple of the things that I might want to get rid of here. Yep, let's, uh, let's exclude those as well as that lower plate, and we'll deal with those connections later. I just want to make sure my beam mesh is doing what it needs to do. <clears throat> so just a, a bare bones channel. I want to make sure all these joints are behaving well. And what I recommend for, for loading for this, don't even worry about what's going on with the, uh, with the loading, the real loading. Go ahead and put some fixtures in here like you, like you want. And I'll fix those little plates down here and assume that those are going to be connected as well. I could also have excluded those and then just fixed the some of the joints here. So that's where my, my uh, suspension comes into play. And then for the loads, just keep it simple. Throw a gravity load in there, which is a body load, and it's going to act on every one of the, of the members. So if anything is not connected, I'm going to see it right away. So I'll just run that. 
bonded interactions beam. So it's given me right away defined bonded local interactions between the beam and the solids and shell. Well, that's those little plates down there. So I, I know it's going to be involved in those. So let's just go ahead and uh, suppress that. And then let's suppress these as well. And we'll deal with those, like I say, in the next step. So there they are. Shift select those and exclude from analysis. Now let's go ahead and fix a couple of the, of the joints. Fixtures can be applied to joints as well as the faces of the model. All right, so I'll just go out and notice that the only thing available to me in here, I've got joints only available. If I have them, when I turn on the other parts, I'll have the faces of the solids that I could apply as well. So I'll grab a couple out here and let's, uh, let's just fix this one here. <clears throat> so I've fixed those. I've got my gravity turned on. Let's go ahead and run that with the default mesh. So I don't even have to tell it to mesh. It will do it automatically if I just tell it to run. All right, so we've got um, we've got some results here. Let's look at displacement. That's a very important one to, to look at. You want to make sure your displacements are as expected. So I've supported it over here and here. So I get that Boeing in the middle, and I get this this one out here that's kind of hanging down. There's not much uh, tying that in together. So that looks reasonable to me that I've got things tied together in terms of the beams themselves. So with that, I go through the next step of, of adding the, the additional components and then take it from there. So this is, this is the very first step. I've suppressed some things. I've added a simple gravity load and some simple fixtures, and I know my beams are good to go. Now I can work through the others. So looking at my solved studies here, <clears throat> looking at this number one study, let that load up. You'll see that this one has the additional uh, plates. And that one looks good. All of them are staying put. Got a displacement there. My fixture is a little bit different here. I've got, um, I've got it fixed out on the corners here like I had before, but I've got it fixed out here on this other end on the right side. So a similar looking uh, displacement. I've got the uh, deformation scale set to one in this case. So um, that all looks good. Things are staying together well. And if I go ahead and advance to the next tab here, the next study tab, and load up those results, I've got um, a very similar. Okay, this one was where I had added some extra, some some contacts in there. I believe I had some of the. Uh, some of the, uh, when I refined the mesh and started looking at the next level, I had some issues with that. And this one also has the, uh, the trailer hitch itself and then the plate. So there's where you see I've got uh, uh, some additional contact sets that have been added here. So this one, I grouped things in folders here. This is our uh, runner supports to the cross beams and then our uh, frame to hitch. So this, these would be out here on this end. And if you look at the uh, definition of these, notice I've got uh, the ability to bond joints. In this case, this joint right here is bonded to the face, the face of the trailer hitch itself. So in this next, this second second stage of development, I've made sure that these parts are going to stay put. And I've got, let's see, this one still does not have the little plates there. So the, the next step along the way is to, to, to build the complete structure. And that's what I've done here. Now this one will have, if I look at the uh, displacement results here, you can see I've got the little uh, support pads for the suspension system itself. Now, as we go and, and add components to the analysis, we have to 
keep checking things. And this displacement plot is a good one to check as you go along. So this one has the complete model. It's got the, the trailer hitch, all the members, the plates supporting the, the, the lumber, the two by six lumber, the support pads where the suspension comes into play. But look at what's, what's showing in this displacement plot. The maximum displacement is on this middle, these two middle uh, lumber supports, but the frame below it does not agree with that displacement. So as I add things to the model, my mesh changes, and sometimes changes uh, the mesh changing will uh, influence the way things are tied together. So that's what's happened here. This one, uh, this it's been carried through on the ends, but not here in the middle. I should see a similar displacement in this middle middle member here. And so when when that happens, now we need to either refine the mesh or add additional supports. And that's what I've done when I went out to the next level here. I've taken that complete structure and I've refined it, refined the mesh to see if I can get some better agreement there and some better results on that, on that displacement. And this one, uh, this one does show that. And what I've done here is I've rendered the profiles within the uh, show to reflect the beams themselves. Let me create, let me create the default plot without that for, for comparison to what we just saw. <clears throat> so there's our comparison to what we saw on the study number three. So you can see now my maximum displacement is out here in this unsupported length. And there's some uh, higher displacements out here on these unsupported lengths as well. And we get similar displacement within the area of interest there that was not bonding very well. And the way that, uh, the way that was improved was by a refinement to the mesh uh, with some mesh controls that you see here on those, uh, on those lumber pieces. Let's see how we're doing with time here. Any questions come up yet, Chris, that uh, I can answer at this point before I move on? Now, the few that have come through, I've, I've uh, handled through the chat. I'll keep, I'll keep tabs on it in case anything comes up at the end. Okay, sounds good. All right, so after working through that incrementally, building the model as we go, um, now we've got a complete model that we can look at our results. I can always hide the, some of the stuff out here to declutter. Once I'm done with the joint group, I can right click and hide it. I can also hide all of the simulation symbols through my hide show option here. That's what this little icon is for. I can turn off all the simulation symbols if I want with a click of a button there. So we've got, uh, we've got uh, some a complete structure that's been refined. We're ready to, to check out the results. Notice we've got uh, our stress plot here. And when you work with weldments, when you generate a stress plot, you have the option to show either the solids and shells or the beams. In this case, this one is showing the solids and shells. You'll notice here in the definition, solids and shells or beams. And if you zoom in, you can see the, the max stress for solids and shells is out there on that on that hitch part. And you can see some stresses in the, the supporting brackets as well. And notice I've turned on the display of the mesh so I can ensure that my quality is, is high enough. A lot of, of the controls, almost all the controls for plots can be uh, accessed through the, the right click on the color bar. And right now, since we're in the edit definition, uh, we've got the ability to uh, look at all of the controls, the, the chart options for showing max and mins, and then uh, showing the mesh is turned on here under the boundary options. And that information can be accessed right here with the right click. We toggle the mesh off quickly. Or I can go to any of those tabs here, edit definition, chart options, or settings. So that's the solid and shell um, stresses. 
when you s display displacements, as you saw, it shows everything. And this is the one that has the render, render on the beam, the beam profile turned on. That comes into play in the definition here under the advanced options, render beam profile right here. So that gives you an idea of the stress distribution across the, the cross section of the beams if there is a variance. All right, let me make sure I've showed you what I want to show you in here before I go into the rest of the presentation. The other thing I wanted to show you was related to the beams themselves. Uh, since we're dealing with the, the weldment structure, one thing you probably want to look into is um, how the how the beams are behaving, what are the reaction forces, what are the specific stresses in the beams, axial and bending, et cetera. If you look at the definition of a beam, if I highlight this one here and I right click on it in the tree, I can go into the definition of that beam and you'll see some color coded end, end indicators here. And we have end conditions that we can edit. So right now, these, this beam and all the beams by default are set to be rigidly connected to the surrounding members. So that can be changed to release any of the degrees of freedom in the rotational or translational directions. You can do that uh, with the hinge would release the translations, slide would re release the rotations, or you can manually specify any of those six directions to release. So that's how we can control if there's something other than a, a totally welded connection between these. I can also revert to a pinned in condition by switching the, the definition over to a truss. So this will just give me a, a pin joint on either end of the, of the beam. <clears throat> While I'm in here, um, as, I, as I showed you, we had in the joint group, we had the, the neutral axis and the shear center. Here are our section properties that get extracted from the actual cross-sectional information of the beams. So we've got all of the, the torsional and shear information here that's used in the background for the calculation. Since we're only representing line lines to, to, uh, to mesh this, these parts, the cross-sectional information is actually embedded in the beam element itself. So that's what we have going on with, uh, with our beams. And then once we get results, we can get a table that shows us all the beam forces and stresses. So I'll set that up here and get some more. I can either toggle from, uh, from forces or stresses. Let's go ahead and keep it on forces. And we've got uh, the range of the beams themselves. And we get this nice table that gives us that information. You can expand that. And actually, let me zoom back a little bit so you can see. Actually, it's not going to let me while I got it on. I'm going to make it a little smaller. And see if I can get to one of these. Actually, let, me, let me do it this way. Get the model to where I can see it. Hide the plot. Show the mesh. Here we go. All right, so if I look at this, if I get this over here a little bit, and then I show my beam forces. and highlight those in the table, you can see which beam it's talking about. So in here, we've got uh, the first beam, and it's got the number of elements that make up that short length of the beam. So each one of these element numbers is used to make that up, and you can see there's quite a few. And we get the actual shear in the two directions, moments, and torques. So that information can can be helpful for sizing things. If I just look at the endpoints, the table gets condensed, and now this is my beam, and I've got the, the two end elements. 
which is probably one of the most important bits of information to get what's going on at the at the ends there. So that's the the type of things that we can do with uh, with our beam joints, and you saw in the table that there are uh, beam directions, and I believe. There it is. Uh, we can show the, the, the beam directions for each of the beams. So when we're looking at the table for the beam, the bending in direction one, direction two, et cetera, we have that information here that tells us how to interpret that. All right, so let me jump back into the remainder. I want to show you some tips and tricks in here related to all this. It's been kind of fast and furious, but uh, kind of summarize it here. One thing I didn't point out when you uh, when you come up with the simulation parts folder, you can you can right click and delete these if you want to just see the the bare list of items. When you do that, there is an issue; they will come back if you uh, reopen the model. So that's a, a an issue that's that needs to be worked out so that that those stay deleted if you want. Uh, minor deal if you deal there. Um, I showed you the excluding from analysis. That's a very uh, important way to simplify your model using that method one that I talked about of uh, that progressive development of the finite element model. The simulation options is a great tool to see the, the settings for, for the hiding and excluding bodies. And then uh, other things are in here that are uh, able, able to be controlled for your the remainder of your simulation studies. Lots of good settings in there, like we have with uh, SOLIDWORKS. <laughs> and I mentioned um, during that presentation in SOLIDWORKS that the weldment setup affects the beam behavior. So with, uh, with the, the structural member, it's, there's different ways where you can do that based on how you've sketched out the, the geometry. So if I, if I take and I put uh, all of these sketch segments for this one uh, area into a group for that structural model, I come up with, uh, when I bring it into to simulation, I get some odd looking behaviors here, like it's missing some joints. And then the mesh is even more odd. Some of the, uh, those cross members don't even get meshed. So uh, the, the other, the way to handle that is in how you set up your sketch and how you set up your your um, the actual structural members themselves. <clears throat> in one case, uh, I got a, a where I tried to put was a single line segment, connect those. You know, the beam joints look good, but then the mesh does not. And when I put the, broke these curved members up into individual selections, that gave me a good looking mesh with good joints. And it was uh, the way to go, and that's what you saw in the end. So, if you get some odd behaviors in the the way the joints come across in simulation or the mesh, investigate how the the, the weldment was created on the SolidWorks side, and then you can uh, work through that, like I did with this one. You need to consider your connections. <laughs> We've got some bonded connections in our model between the plates and the, the cross member beams and then the, the lumber. So we don't take into account the, uh, the, weld, the weld information there. We simply bond that plate completely. So this would require, if you wanted to dig into that a little further to look at that a little more, more carefully, it would require uh, a separate analysis and you could break out you know, these, these parts and get those, those uh, beam forces from the, the big model and put them into a separate analysis that was you know, at these these parts kind of broken out, and uh, use a solid shell mixed mesh to do that, not not the beams. That would allow you to get the actual connection forces in that joint. <coughs> One thing that um, is really powerful is the use of the SolidWorks selection sets in your SolidWorks tree. If you have a group of things that you want to save, you can right click on that selection and tell it to create a selection set. And, and um, so in this example, I've got two selection sets. 
I've selected the four faces out here to create a new one. That's the uh, four faces where those loads or the supports from the spring leaf springs come into play. Um, right click on any one of those after you've highlighted them with the control selection. You go to selection tools, save selection, new selection set, and you'll end up with this new set here. So that's quite handy for doing a lot of um, setup and simulation if you've got those, if you've got those sets saved. Uh, specifically, I use that to come up with the reaction forces uh, from the, the loading that I applied. I put uh, the weight of the boat, which is about 2,700 pounds, I believe, uh, or something around there. That plus gravity gives you this resultant force, yeah, 20, 2875. So um, you'll see the, the resultant vector arrows here, the black arrows. Those are the resultant force vectors that came into play when I went to my result force and use my selection set that I previously set up Got those reactions. And as I mentioned, uh, the displacement plot is really the best way to check for the connectivity of the mesh. Make sure you do that each step of the way as you build the model and uh, make sure that displacements look realistic. It's definitely a good idea to, to animate that if it's not totally clear, if you're in doubt, this was pretty obvious. But uh, if you animate it with the amplif amplified displacement, then you'll see where parts might be um, moving to, through, the, through each other. And that would be a good sign that you haven't gotten things tied together.